This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today, alongside Bob Pastorella, we're going to be chatting with Sadie Hartman, otherwise known as Mother Horror. Now, Sadie has done so much for horror, continues to do so much for horror, She is the co-owner and co-founder of Nightworms, in which they curate these fantastic horror boxes, including the Malamaniacs Josh Malaman package. Nightworms also has a series of reviewers and influencers within the Instagram Bookstagram community. And Sadie is a reviewer for publications such as Scream Magazine, Cemetery Dance, and it is my understanding that quite literally days ago, she got a new piece commissioned by Fangoria. And so, of course, with so many achievements, with so many accolades, myself and Bob Pastorella thought it was time to get Sadie on the podcast and that is what we're presenting to you today but before the conversation let us have a quick word from our sponsors being an independent publisher we are just like you we share the same passion the same love for horror fiction we believe in the incredible work being created unnoticed by the mainstream And we want to share it with the world. We are the Sinister Horror Company. Following a cryptic message from her brother, Beth Davis finds herself in the strange coastal town of Netherworld Bay and discovers a secret cult planning to bring about the end of days. Can she stop them in time, or will she lose her very soul forever? The Netherwell Horror is a terrifying, blood-soaked tale that is not to be missed. Available in ebook and paperback and now on audio, search The Netherwell Horror on Audible or Amazon now. Don't just read horror, experience it. Okay, well, with that said, let us not delay. It's time for Sadie Hartman on This Is Horror. Sadie, welcome to This Is Horror. Hello, it is really great to be here. Yes, great to have you here. And I know to begin with, let's talk a little bit about your origin story in terms of your love for horror. So it is my understanding that your mother is largely responsible because she had a big collection of horror books and you read a lot of them from an early age so (laughs) let's talk about that let's talk about some of the books that you first read and how that kind of ignited a passion a lifelong passion for horror yeah so uh, my mom is definitely an avid reader and um she really encouraged that in my and my sisters um she i don't know if you in um, the UK, if you guys have Scholastic Book Club that comes to your school, I'm familiar. You I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then Bob, did you do you remember those? Oh yeah. School. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that was one of the most exciting things about school for me was getting those book club um, sheets and taking them home, and my mom would go through them with me, and I would pick out um, books that I wanted to get through the book club, uh, and so I read like a lot of chapter books as soon as I was able and then, you know, more advanced reading material as I got older. But my love of books never really waned. It just kind of kept growing and growing. Um, And I would say that I started gathering books to myself that were a little darker than um, maybe like what the average kids were reading. So 
um, John Belair's had a series of like these kids that would go on these like mysterious quests that would always end in like a haunted mansion or, you know, unlocking some secret tomb somewhere. Um, And I really liked the darkness of that. And the illustrations were always really kind of creepy. Um, And then I started reading my mom's Agatha Christie series of um, mysteries and just kind of longing. I felt like this longing in my heart when I was reading those books for like more of the grisly details. Um, Like there would always be something mysterious and spooky going on and people dying, but there wasn't really like a description of (laughs) the horrible things. Um, And I probably thought that that was a little bit weird and that didn't prompt me to start researching horror at all. Um, I think what prompted me to be honest, was going to my mom's bookshelves and looking at the covers of her horror collection and being somewhat too timid to start reading them myself, um, but just being really drawn to those, you know, kind of freaky covers with skulls and vampires and ugly things. So I think I was around... 12 when I stole her Salem's Lot. Um, And I think I chose Salem's Lot, if I can remember correctly, just because the cover was so boring. Like, it just kind of was this little village um, inside of the O of the lot, if you guys can remember, like, the original uh, book cover. So I swooped it, and I would read it at night, And I would kind of keep it under the blanket just in case she walked in. I could, she wouldn't see what I was reading. Um, And then after that, I just started reading all of them. Uh, And I think she figured out that I had stolen her it because that's like a pretty huge gap in your (laughs) bookshelf or the size of where it would be. Um, And she said, Sadie, are you reading my Stephen King books? She just like outright asked me one time and I was like, yeah, (laughs) yeah, I've been reading your Stephen King books. And it was really cool because my mom was like, well, which ones? You know, she was all really enthusiastic about it. She wasn't discouraging. So that started the love affair, Stephen King, for so many of us. Oh, yeah. And I mean, before you actually picked up the courage to pick up the book and you were looking at those covers, I mean, did you start imagining what the stories within could be because I know a lot of people that we've spoken to and Orin Gray is one who springs to mind he actually started making up what stories and what universal monster pictures could be about so he told himself his kind of imagined version of the story before he actually read or watched it Oh, that's so cute. Um, <laughs> well, I I don't I did this too with videos. Um, so like going into a video store with all the VHS covers, I would kind of I would gather the movies that I wanted to take home, but then I would also kind of sneak off and look at the horror covers um, just to see like something really nasty. And especially like if you like the covers were always scary, but at the back of the cover was always pretty gross too. Cause they would have like movie stills, mm. um, of like bloody faces and stuff. So, um, on the Stephen King books, oftentimes he just has an author photo on the back of the book. So there's no real description. And, um, I would kind of open up and look at the sides of the dust jackets where, like the story would kind of be told. And I just, I wasn't really um, reading those, to be honest. Like, I think it was just, I would look at them, but I just thought that that would be too scary for me. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. Now, I'm looking at the cover of the Salem's Lot, the original hardback. I've never seen that cover because in, I, I came across the book in paperback. And I'm looking at this cover going, why? Yeah. I mean, it's just like this near this little village in the O. Yeah, the it's kind of boring. <laughs> you know, and it's like, what in the world? And, you know, and it's like, and I guess the paperback, you know, 
it's got the, the one I'm familiar with and has like the, 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 it's kind of black and blue and it has the little face. And I think there's a fang. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and it kind of gives you an idea, but this right here, you're looking at it and you'd be like going that Salem's lot. If I didn't know anything about Stephen King, I'd be like, what is this? Like some kind of little drama. Yeah. About, you know, about a little family here, you know, and then <laughs> can you imagine people who read this just like going, it's a, this is a little drama going on. What's this weird stuff happening? Oh, my God. You know? <laughs> That's it's awesome. This like, is about a quaint little small town mm-hmm. with yeah, quiet you drama. Know, Keith's just rubbing his hands together going, read it, read it. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, the other covers, like the ones that actually kind of freaked me out, um, was The Shining, interestingly enough. There's not really, t- t- like total horror on the cover but i didn't like the fact that danny's eyes were kind of like whited out yeah yeah so that one kind of freaked me out and fire starter freaked me out um my mom's cover of carrie was the one and that one's also a weird cover because um there's just a woman on the cover and she kind of looks like a gypsy or something um she has like a long flowy dress or something it's only like the half of her face um but she's pretty you know, so it doesn't really have anything to do with Carrie because it's not like an awkward teenage girl or the mom. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, I don't know what they were thinking, you know, back back then doing doing the hardback covers. I mean, to me, nowadays you get a book and it's a hardback cover and you're just like, oh, pretty much, you get an idea of what you're getting into. Yeah. You, know, you don't know the story, but you know that, you know, I can't think of no, you know, even, even like John Langan's The Fisherman, you you look at that cover and it's, it's, and it's a gorgeous painting. Oh yeah. But you also get a sense of, you know, it's like there's a, there's a, it's basically, there's a coming storm and it's like, and that's, that gives you a sense of, of ominous, you know, but this, this is just idyllic, you know, little, little quaint little village, you know. And it looks like something you'd see on a, you know, on a John Irving cover. <laughs> yeah, know? so true. Not that that's bad. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, I tell people all the time, you know, you read the world according to Garp. And if you don't cry and, or feel outraged or anything like that, then you're just not a human being. Because, I mean, that's a, a, an amazing novel. Uh, not horror, but think there there are a couple of parts that could be considered horrifying. Yeah. Uh, you know, I and mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's really, really good. But, uh, yeah, this, this cover, I don't know what they, what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose because a number of them were so innocuous that it did mean that people who weren't necessarily drawn to horror and dark fiction probably picked them up and then they served as a bit of a gateway drug. I mean, either Mm. that or they just got completely traumatized. But either way, it probably worked out okay for King. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think um, it's funny. I went to a small paperback bookstore that I had never been to before. And the guy that owned the store was really kind and welcoming. And he said, what are you looking for today? And I said, well, actually, I was wondering if you had a horror section. That's my favorite. And then he said, he kind of looks at me funny and he's like, well, I don't like it, but I do have a section. And he kind of leads me over to this shelf and he gestures at the whole wall. And he says, yeah, this is the horror section. And I said, okay, great, thanks. So it hadn't been picked over in a long time. Like there was so much stuff there. And I just gathered all these books and I brought them up to the counter and he picks up, uh, I found a paper, an old paperback of Legion. Mm. Um, and I, he says, ooh, you know, is this the same author that wrote The Exorcist? And I said, ooh, yeah, and I, I've never read this book, so I'm really excited about it. And he said, you know what, I went and saw The Exorcist with a friend, and I just walked right out of it. I just, first, like, 20 minutes, I was just out. There's, like, a dog fight and something going on in the beginning, and I just thought, this isn't for me. This is gross. And he says that he walks out of the movie, and then, like, 10 minutes later, his friend comes and joins him and is like, Oh, this is too much. Like people who who enjoy this stuff, something's wrong with them. Like that's what he tells me <laughs> while I'm buying all this paperback horror from him. 
<laughs> it's a little bit like, okay, guy. Yeah, that is so bizarre. And I mean, when we were speaking with Alan Baxter the other day, we were saying it's a little bit weird when, you know, you tell someone you're a writer and they ask what you write and you say horror and they say something like, oh, I, I don't like that. And it's like, well, mm -hmm. well great. Yep. Thank you for your little <laughs> appraisal and review on <laughs> on my taste. But it's even more bizarre as a, as a bookseller. I mean, it doesn't seem like it makes a lot of financial sense. I mean, what's he doing trying to <laughs> discourage you from buying the books that you went in for? But I, I don't know, like, People like to share their opinion a lot, even if they know it's the opposite of the person they're talking mm. to, I, I guess. Yes, it, that is so true. Yeah, it's, it's probably all about the ego, really. Yeah, so, so true. Like, um, I used to think, too, that maybe people who worked at video stores weren't allowed to give their opinion of the movies that you were checking out because they would never say anything unless it was good. I mean, sometimes you would hand over your videos you were checking out and they'd be like, oh, this movie's so cool. But like you would put something up there and they just wouldn't say anything, you know, so I kind of thought maybe they were coached, you know, to not say anything because people are spending money buying these videos it would be lame for them to be like oh this movie sucks yeah <laughs> you know yeah so i mean yeah. i'm imagining in either the the bookstore or the video rental situation i mean the only time where i feel it would be reasonable for me to express a negative opinion is if somebody comes up to me and maybe they're choosing between a couple or three movies and they want to know which one would would I go for and why? And mm. then I think, okay, you've been given permission to to share right. that opinion. But if someone slaps a movie down on the counter, they're really excited about it. And I see it and I think, yeah, that was not good. <laughs> you know, don't don't suck the joy out of that moment for them. Because also yeah. taste is subjective. They might absolutely love it. So, you know, don't do that. It goes back to the, to that classic rule. Don't be a dick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not mm -hmm. hard. <laughs> but I mean, as we're talking about films, I mean, obviously, your mother was really encouraging in terms of the books that you were picking up. But was it a similar thing with movies? And was she as much a horror movie fan as she was a horror book fan? <laughs> I have the funniest story about that. Yes, my parents are huge movie buffs. I mean, basically, the format of movies and, you know, books and music, it's all just storytelling. You know, humans love to tell each other stories. And and that's what we're doing when we're engaging in all these mediums. And my parents were huge, huge on all three of them. So I got all of my early musical taste from my parents listening to all of their music and then later you know the stuff that I was listening to in high school was influencing their music tastes um, and then it's the same with movies you know they were watching a lot of foreign films um, and so I watched a lot of foreign films early on um, a lot of black and white movies my mom and I on like a Saturday would watch an old black and white movie or just like a movie that she really loved that she wanted to introduce to me like I remember when we watched Cinema Paradiso, and I was just laid out after I watched it. It was just the most beautiful, most romantic, awesome movie I've ever seen in my life. Um, and, you know, I just have her to credit for that because it never would have come across my radar um, at the age when I watched it. And with horror movies, however, um, I do remember that The Shining was on TV one time. She was folding laundry. And I was like, oh, what are you watching? And she said, oh, it's the, it's the movie adaptation of The Shining. And I had read the book at the time. So I had I knew the story. And she's like, do you want to watch it with me? And I I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, so I sat down and we watched it. And I by the end of it, I was terrified. Like just a totally different um, feeling and reaction than when I had read the book. Like just straight up couldn't even go to bed that night scared. And then later in life, much later in life, after I had had kids and, you know, married and everything, uh, my mom 
would try to invite me over to watch horror movies with her and I would always reject it. Like, no, I just don't, I don't do this anymore. I don't watch horror movies. You know, my husband's afraid of horror movies too. Like we just don't do it. So one time she begged me to come over and watch, uh, Juwan, which is, Mm. you know, the job Japanese ring. Mm -hmm. And, um, I refused, refused. And then she was like really convincing CD, you remember when we used to watch, you know, foreign films together? And this is kind of a blend of horror and and the foreign film thing. And I think we would really enjoy it together. And and, and she had already seen it. And she's like, I think you would really like it. Well, I went over there and several times I wanted to turn it off. Like I would ask her, like I would have the pillow up over my face and be like, mom, please just turn it off. You know, and I'm like a grown ass woman at this point. And she's like, no, no, we need to finish. You need to see the end. Well, I did finish. And the whole drive home, like, I was completely undone. And I slept with the light on, much to the, like, disappointment of my husband for, like, three days. It was, yeah, it's just not a good experience for me. So was, Horror movies was, are was this hard. you on or was this ring dude that you were watching? I mean, both were oh, pretty sorry, terrifying. Oh, sorry, I did say ring. Yeah, no, it was Juwan. Yeah, I the mean, grudge. I mean that they're, they're both gonna probably have a similar effect, to be quite honest. And mm-hmm. I mean, how long ago was that? Just as a time frame, because you're saying you were married at the time. Yeah, married with kids. Yeah. Um, you know, had our own house and everything, and went over to her house to watch it, and drove home to my own house. Um, and I just kept visualizing that ghost with that mm. open mouth sound you know, yeah. rising up behind the bed. Um, I I don't know exactly how old I was. want to say it was at least 10 years ago. So I was probably like 32 or somewhere around in that neighborhood. Um, and then, you know, I do watch quite a bit of like horror here and there. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, I'll watch like the It movie. I, I saw the It movie in It Chapter 2. And um, we watched The Lighthouse our, our theater was, you know, cool enough to get that one. Um, and then the the most recent movie that freaked me out was Hereditary, and I swore <sighs> yeah. off of horror movies again. Like, now I'm done again. I can't do it. Mm. Yeah. Do you think you have, like, specific triggers or things that are more likely to kind of generate that reaction? So, I mean, if you're going to see something that is horror in the cinema do you have to pretty closely look at the synopsis to check that you know this isn't gonna be something that will keep you up for a matter of days or even Mm. weeks i mean i thought hereditary was going to be kind of a quiet psychological horror um maybe you know a lot of what happens at the last like 30 minutes of that Mm. movie is not what you would expect from just reading the synopsis. Like it, it went full on, oh, you know? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I thought it was going to be one thing and it was something entirely different, but then I went, it was my birthday and we were staying in a hotel and we went and saw that movie. And then we came back to the hotel and, you know, my husband falls right asleep. I mean, he was disturbed too. We talked about it the whole way driving to the hotel, Um, but he just falls asleep and I'm just laying there. Like, I can't even like my eyes must've looked like saucers. Like I'm just scanning the room for something hovering in the corner, you know? So I don't know if it was, if there's like certain triggers, but, or if there's a common theme between like something like Juwan and something like hereditary, but man, that's like off the charts for me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Those two movies. And I feel because it was your birthday that it would have been completely reasonable to wake up your husband and be like, "Uh uh-uh, you're not (laughs) doing that, not tonight, not on my birthday. We are talking about this. (laughs) Well, I ended up watching, um, you know how you can do like a brain cleanser? So I just Mm. turned the TV on and watched these two guys were like, had like a fishing video or something. It was like, they're out on the lake pulling in fish and being all happy about their catches and stuff and that was like super wholesome for me yeah yeah no yeah. I, I i completely relate to that because i mean particularly with with my wife if she sees something and 
it affects her too much. It's like, right, we need to watch an episode of a comedy or a romance mm -hmm. before we go to bed because I'm not going to mm. bed <laughs> with that as the final image. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To cleanse the palate. Yeah. 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 A brain scrub. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Now, something I wondered about, and as you've listened to a lot of these episodes, you may have anticipated, but I wonder what life lessons did you learn growing up? Life lessons. Well, I did write a post. Um, kind of opening up and being a little more vulnerable with the community about um, who I was kind of growing up. Uh, I was a little bit awkward. Uh, I was really skinny and kind of had a lot of awkward feelings about my body and just not having the same body as some of the girls that were more popular in school who were like already developing and you know, boys were showing them attention and things. So um, I was bullied a little bit. Uh, and I kind of had this life lesson taught to me by my mom and my dad, actually, um, because I'm six feet tall. I reached uh, that height, I think, around eighth grade, freshman year. Uh, and my parents were like, you know, I said, I can't, I'm trying to think like how they first figured it out. I came home one time and I had like a spitball in my hair. Um, one of the girls that was particularly hard on me would put spitballs in my hair. Like she would chew up wads of paper and spit them at me. Um, and I came home and my mom plucked it out of my hair and she was like, what is this? And so I finally kind of explained to her what was going on and she just told me, she said, you know, you, you are six feet tall at home. You are confident. You are strong. Like you are well adjusted. You need to just exude that confidence and that use your height, you know, to just be intimidating in those situations. You know, like if you need to, you can utilize the gifts that you have, you know, your gift of words. Um, I was really good in English and stuff. So she was like, use your gift of words, use your height to just, I don't know, like bully them back in a way, you know, just kind of be intimidating. So um, when you need to, because I'm just not that person. I don't know if you, when, when you guys were growing up, if you just knew people who were just, you stayed away from them because they were that person. Um that's just, that just wasn't me. Uh, so I did get back on the bus probably like a week later and that girl was already at it again, like saying mean things to me and teasing me. And I knew it was going to be a long bus ride that I just didn't want to endure. And I took my parents' words of advice about being intimidating when I needed to. And I bolstered up some strength and I walked up to her on the bus and she kind of cowered back against the wall and I got in her face and I was like, I've had enough. Like I, you cannot do this to me anymore. And if you do, like, I will hurt you. I'm bigger than you. I'm stronger than you. Like this is the end, you know, whatever conversation we had, it was like the heat of the moment kind of thing. And when I sat back down, the bus driver looked at me and kind of was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, because I feel for him, the bus drivers in those situations too, because I mean, he had been privy to everything that was going on for a while, but he's like one adult, you know, with all these kids and he's driving a bus. Like there wasn't like a lot he could do a couple of times he would, you know, pull over and tell us to calm down or whatever. But yeah, that was, that was a big moment in Sadie history where I learned that when I needed to, I could kind of fake it. <laughs> I could fake the toughness. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that story could only have been better if everyone had just got up out of their seat and given you a standing ovation for that. <laughs> but In a movie, that would happen. Yeah, yeah. So if ever Mother Horror, the movie, is made, then that's going to be a scene in it. And I'm looking forward to it. I don't know yeah, if anyone, anyone out there wants to make that happen. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. We, we, we've asked people to do film adaptations of books before, but never of someone's life on the podcast. But, yeah, I would have to pick like the scrawniest child actor you could find because I had, you know, being six feet tall, it's all in my legs. So right. my sisters called me daddy long legs and stuff because I just had these these little buggy whips hanging out of my right, shorts. Right. I called legs with these knobby knees. Yeah. yeah. It took a while to grow into those. But I mean, I imagine after that moment that it was a turning point because so often with bullies, they're looking for an easy target. They're looking mm -hmm. for, t for someone to show their strength or the way in which they can push people around. But actually, most of the time, I mean, this bullying is coming from deep insecurities. And, you know, tragically, it's normally because someone is bullying them. Mm -hmm. And so if you show actually you're not going to be able to push me about and you are going to have a hard time and guess what? I'm also bigger than you. So, you know, don't fuck with me. <laughs> then yeah. they, they soon back down. Yep. That that is one of those life lessons that I think are invaluable that, you know, I try to tell my kids too. Um, when they were growing up, I would kind of remember that lesson that my parents taught me early on and just be like, you know, you you don't have to be pushed around like that. You can stand up for yourself. Um, and one of the schools, actually, that my 14-year-old, uh, when he was a little bit younger, one of the schools that he went to had a zero tolerance for bullying, but it also worked in a strange way to where you couldn't even defend yourself. Like, it was like any physical activity would result in a suspension. So my kid was being bullied in the bathroom and he pushed the child back, you know, and that child ended up getting hurt. And when they went to the principal's office, they were both suspended. And, you know, just in having a conversation with the principal, I told him, I said, well, I, you know, what was he supposed to do in this situation? And he told my husband and I that an appropriate response is to get help or to just, you know, say no and stand there and take it basically. <laughs> and, you know, without physical altercation, like you have to just express your, your feelings and tell people mm -hmm. to, to stop. Um, so we were just, we're mm -hmm. like, fine, you know, we'll, we'll accept the suspension, but we're taking our kid out for ice cream <laughs> for defending himself. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I went I, to my school, did the same thing. And, you know, if you got in a fight, especially in high school, uh, and the, like the one big fight that I was ever in was from a bully and I was defending myself. And uh, so we both we both got suspended. Uh, but I mean, and they also like threatened to call the cops because we wouldn't stop fighting. And I, you know, so I ended up having, you know, we almost got in a fight in the principal's office, you know, and I told, I told the principal, I said, I'm defending myself. I will do what mm -hmm. I have to do. Yeah. He's like, he goes, well, I'll just call the police. I'm like, get on the phone, call them. <laughs> I, said, I wish I could have been a quiet off. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done. And, you know, and they were like, okay, okay, okay. You know, so they've got, you know, another counselor in to separate us. And we had to do, we, basically, we had to do uh, after school suspension or basically what they called detention after class. But he had to do his, uh, he did his first and then they made me do mine two weeks later. So we would not even be, you know, in the, in the whole thing, you know, together. Yeah. And, this, this, and I had no classes with this guy. And uh, he still lives around here. I ran into him a couple of years ago at, at funny at, at, at a video store, and uh, and he he was joking about the fight, and uh, he said he, he was like he goes yeah you were really really mad, and I was just listening to him talk and everything. And when he finally stopped talking, I said hey man look it's real simple I didn't like you then and I definitely don't like you now. <laughs> And he was like, he just looked at me, just stunned. And I said, you can fuck off. <laughs> yeah, nice, Bob. And he goes, he was like, well, well, okay. I was like, yeah, we'll see you. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's, you have to defend yourself. Yeah. You know, and it's, 
Yeah. You can only ignore for so long. And that's, you know, my dad always told me, hey, you got to ignore him, ignore him, ignore him, ignore him. And finally, you know, he's like, you look, know, okay, this isn't working. <laughs> You're going to have to fight back. And it took me a long time to do that. Uh, mainly because my mom would be like, please don't fight back. You're just going to get hurt, you know. And so once you fight back, like in your case, things change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it definitely did. I don't even remember seeing her on the bus after that. Like, I don't know if it's just like a weird version of my memory. Like, oh, you stood up to her and then she was just disappeared. But honestly, I can't remember having a single altercation with her after that. And I don't remember like seeing her or being nervous about her or anything after that. So I I honestly think she just stopped riding the bus after that. You scared her away forever. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I, I think Eva interpretation is brilliant because i mean on one hand you know she's bullied you for so long you stand up once and now she's permanently off the bus but on the <laughs> other it's kind of like before when she was like acting in the role of the bully she was almost there was almost a spotlight or something on her but then after she was so insignificant it's like i can't even see you it's like, no, mm -hmm. I, I literally can't see you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You're to the cornfield. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just your way. You have a power, Sadie. You just don't know it. Now you have yeah, a superpower. Yeah. <laughs> see, if we had sound bites before episode started, that would be it. Just Bob telling you you have a power. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> But I mean, yeah, we've spoken a lot about your love for horror and how that got started. But I'm wondering how this then transformed into something you do and work with professionally. Because I mean, mm -hmm. you're running Nightworms, which is hugely successful. I mean, you're not just running it, you co-founded it. You're also reviewing for a number of respected publications including cemetery dance and scream and then instagram in terms of that horror bookstagram community has also been pivotal for you so at what point did you decide you wanted to work within horror as a vocation well when i first started a bookstagram account i it was an interesting situation because I had just a normal Instagram account where you post pictures of your kids and food and, you know, your friends and family would engage with you. Um, but I would post pictures of books and, and things that I was reading and it would just be crickets. Like I just, my friends and family, like, except for my mom or, you know, my sisters were just, they, they weren't interested in my book posts. Um, and one time I, worked at a kitchen store uh, in our downtown area in our small town. And there was a bookstore right up the street where that I would pre-order all of my horror books uh, through them, like Joe Hill new books and, and Stephen King's new books. And um, the bookstore uh, called me and told me that I had a new book and to come and pick it up. So it was Mr. Mercedes, if I remember correctly. And I ran up there and I got it. And I took a picture of it for social media as I was so excited. And it was around that time that I had learned about hashtags too. So I posted like, you know, yay, the new Stephen King hashtag uh, might have been like Stephen King fan or something like that. And then I clicked on it and I just saw like all these pictures, like the whole world just opened up to me on Instagram just like other Stephen King collectors and they were using that hashtag bookstagram and then I clicked on that and just rabbit trailed after that and I just started adding all of these bookstagrammers that were posting you know not just horror but like just tons of books that I had enjoyed and I decided that I was going to have a dedicated bookstagram account like they did so I stopped posting like all that stuff and my friends and family started peeling off like right after I was just posting pictures of books every single day um, and really got entrenched in the bookstagram community. Um, and at this point, 
uh, I think I've been doing it for four years. And I started off as Sadie Reads Them All. That was my username. But as I started um, running challenges and meeting other people who read a lot of horror, uh, I would lead this, um, I guess you could call it like a book club, but I called it Season of Horror. And for the month of October, we would read horror for the entire month, like just horror. And I started realizing that season of horror was not ending. So I would start early in September, read straight horror through September, October, didn't want to finish by November, still reading it at Christmas time. And uh, people started calling me mother horror because I would just encourage people like, let's keep going, let's keep doing this, we got this, you know, um, including my business partner, Ashley, for Nightworms. Um, she was not a huge horror fan at the time, and she joined me on Season of Horror every time I did it. Um, and so she's the one that actually started the whole mother horror thing. Uh, but yeah, so then um, changed my username to Mother Horror on Instagram. And Scream Magazine, the editor at Scream, actually um, DM'd me, and he asked me, um, hey, you know, like, you read a lot of horror. Do you think you're ever going to get sick of it? And I wrote back to him, no, no not, not anytime soon. Like, I've been reading it my whole life, and I'm pretty into it. And then he said, well, would you ever want to review it for the magazine? And I about died. I can't even tell you what that day was like. Um, but yeah, I accepted for sure. And I think from that particular moment, um, it was really soon after that Cemetery Dance, um, Blue at Cemetery Dance asked me if I wanted to review horror for their online uh, reviewing platform. And I accepted that. And then honestly, it's just everything's been kind of steamrolling since that moment um, from the bookstagram to like then sharing reviews and doing things on Twitter um, to then starting Nightworms and then yeah quitting I had to quit my job because trying to maintain a part-time job but also being heavily active on social media is a bad combination right um, yeah <clears throat> it's really it's not doable um I was working in early childhood education. I was working at the local children's museum and it was like a daycare uh, situation. So as soon as the kids would go down for a nap, it, we would, you know, sit in between the children and kind of like pat their backs to help them fall asleep. And it was during that time that my employer said that I could get on my phone, you know, from nap time mm -hmm. through lunch and um, promote night worms and, make sure I was engaging with everybody on my social media posts and stuff. But yeah, it was, it was a hard transition from at that time doing the part-time job and doing a side hustle. Uh, and then, yeah, eventually my side hustle became my only hustle. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Is the editor and owner at Scream still rich? Do you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it cause, is rich. Because there's an interesting parallel to, I mean one of the first things I did within genre was to review for Scream magazine and to run some interviews so I mean when I decided that was something I wanted to get into I contacted him I think there'd only been one episode of Scream magazine at the time and then I ran some interviews with the likes of Adam Neville and David Moody and then found that there was so much demand for these horror interviews that I thought, well, I can't possibly fit it all in Scream. And this is horror was born. So it's just interesting to, to hear that parallel. Yeah, I didn't know that. that. That's interesting that that was kind of what sparked your, your whole desire to go on with that too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, to have had Scream approach you and Cemetery Dance, and I believe you said in a, in a relatively recent interview that Black Static were also interested. I mean, that really is testament to not only all the hard work that you're doing, but just 
how big you've kind of built your following and how much you're respected within the industry. So, I mean, that's just fantastic. Yeah, it's it's been um, a really interesting journey. Uh, for the most part, I think that the horror community is like a family. Um, and just as soon as I started posting my bookstagram pictures and stuff, it was I was actually kind of something new. I feel like because I remember posting these flat lays and stuff that I was doing for bookstagram where you put a book and a typewriter and a doily and you take these really cozy photographs and I would post it on Twitter and tag the author and the publishers and they were like what is this like these you know aesthetically pleasing photographs that keep showing up on on Twitter you know this is awesome and I tagged um Jeremy Robert Johnson in a flat lay photo of Skullcrack City. And he was like, this is weird, man. Like, I love this, these, these people on Instagram who take these pictures of like books and stuff in these cozy settings. Like, I'm really down with this. Um, and so I started inviting like friends from Bookstagram to go over to Twitter and be like, hey, like the authors and the publishers are like loving these bookstagram photos like we're all used to it over on instagram that's what we do every day but like i don't think they're seeing that stuff on twitter like you should come over and and do it like they love it so i had like a bunch of my little friends that i was you know palling around with at the time come over and and start posting their bookstagram photos over there too because i mean i think it would be really special as an author i mean correct me if i'm wrong but to see your book out in the wild like treasured in this way where someone's taken the time to take a really pretty picture it must feel kind of cool like it, it's so exciting and you know mm -hmm. as someone who's almost released his first book because it's going to be out in the next month I mean to see people curating it and like creating these special photographs I mean it it's a good feeling I'll say that and yeah I mean and when, when we were talking to Damien Angelica Walters, she said something very similar and just looking at the most recent book, The Dead Girls Club, I mean, you could look at that hashtag and people have spent a considerable amount of effort with their photos for Instagram. And I mean, I think at the moment, like Instagram and YouTube, and I've said this before, I mean, they're probably the most exciting social networks and still untapped relative to the potential that they have. I mean, pretty much everyone is on Twitter or Facebook or has tried it and then disappeared off of it. But I still think that Instagram and YouTube are growing markets. Oh, yeah. Like, when I first started Bookstagram, nobody was getting review copies, really. I mean, maybe some of the bigger accounts uh, were seen as influencers and they were getting um, some partnerships with Penguin and Crown Point and stuff like that. Um, but these days, I think Bookstagram is, you know, a movement and the publishers are really aware of it. Like there, there are all the big publishers have influencer programs that they invite us to. So like, you'll just get a random message from a publisher and they'll say, you know, are you interested in getting free books and review copies and, you know, um, joining us. And all you have to really do is like, you don't, I mean, some of them, the big ones, you don't even have to read and review the books they want you to, but you don't have to, they just want you to take pictures of the books. Like yeah. they, they definitely see it as a marketing uh, angle at this point. Um, and so as soon as that evolution started and people started recognizing the power and the influence that bookstagrammers have over each other, um, because that's all we do is like, oh, hey, look at this book I, I, I just got. And then everybody wants it. You know, all of your comments are filled up with people being like, I want it now. Um, so I mean, it's an invaluable free resource, like a, basically a free resource because, the publishers are already sending out, you know, so many free copies of and review copies. So at least now they can put them in the hands of people who are actually posting it on social media and creating hype for them. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, to show 
how much I believe in the Bookstagram community when I was talking to Max Booth at Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing about how we're going to promote the girl in the video. Obviously, because they're an independent press, there's only a finite amount of paperbacks and hard copies that they're going to have. But I said, I really think we should look at prioritizing those hard copies for Bookstagram because I think that's where, you know, you need the physical book. You know, if you're reviewing for, for a website or a podcast, you can have a Moby, but you know, it's not going to look as good if you've just got a picture of you with the book on your Kindle on Instagram. I mean, if, if you've got a decent Kindle and it's full <laughs> colour, it will still look yeah. good, but come on, mm -hmm. the, the paperback is clearly better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I even think that some authors um, realize the full potential of a paperback copy because I think a a lot of uh, their back catalog was digitized and, right. you know, people were going, well, don't you have hardcover copies? Like, don't you have a paperback? And so some of the self-published authors that I know um, kind of got this whole thing started on Instagram where if you look at their hashtag now, I mean, it's blown up because they heard the demand and provided, you know, made some hardcover copies or some, you know, just even paperback copies of their books so that Instagrammers, bookstagrammers can photograph them. I mean, that's that's changing the way that books are being published. Yeah, yeah. And I think, honestly, I mean, every book really should have a physical copy, an electronic copy, and an audio copy. And I feel if you don't, that is not only money that you're leaving off the table but it's potential readers because i mean there's a whole movement of people who mostly listen to books so they go for audio books and then also you've got people such as the bookstagram community who are going to prefer paperbacks and hardbacks but then also there's a whole movement of people who prefer digital books because of the convenience so i feel you need it in every format, otherwise you're missing out. And well, personally, I don't want to miss out. Yeah, no, it's it's good to have all the formats, like you said, because there's different readers for that prefer different platforms. And I mean, I just got a Kindle for Christmas. I, w I was opposed to e-reading for a really long time. I thought, no, you know, I'm on my computer or my phone like all the time. Like the last thing I want to do is read my books on a device, you know, Um but I got one for Christmas and I love it. And I am reading a lot of advanced reading copies on the Kindle, but that's why I made those. Um, I made these like mother horror branded, uh, I don't even know like what you would call them. They're social media posts, but they have like my mother horror brand on it. And then uh, a picture of the cover of the book and then like a blurb or something from my review on the side of it um, so that that way there's still a visual to go with the post and I can still post something to Instagram um, because my Kindle is not color. So it's not attractive to post pictures of it on um, social media. So I made those review cards as like a, a response to that. Yeah. And, and again, I think they look so good and I can back up what I'm saying because earlier today I put your mother horror card on my Instagram uh, oh. praising the girl in the video. So. Oh, yeah, I love that book, Michael. It's Thank such you. a good book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm hugely appreciative of you taking the time to to read it and, and to review it for Cemetery Dance. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It took no time at all. Honestly, listeners, that book is the most bingeable, unput downable story ever. I was always mm -hmm. sad when I had to like close the Kindle on it because I was like too tired to read in bed or something. Um, but yeah, super bingeable, super addicting. Have to read it all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I would be foolish to correct a guess so there we go you've heard it here <laughs> right. you've got to pick yeah. up the girl in the video by an mm -hmm. author called michael david wilson <laughs> yes definitely 
Man, well, www don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing the Tony <laughs> McMillan thing. <laughs> well, I mean, I still want to get into, I guess, maybe the rules or the way in which you operate your Instagram because it's clear that a lot of thought has gone into it and it's incredibly meticulous. So, I mean, firstly, in terms of the posts that you do, do you have any do's and don'ts? Do you have things that you particularly want to capture there and other things that you've just decided that for whatever reason won't appear on your mother horror Instagram? Hmm. I think at first I was very, uh, I don't want to say worried is the right word, but I was I was very meticulous about what I was posting um, and I wanted my feed to look a certain way. I wanted it to have a certain aesthetic. Um, I was posting daily, sometimes two times a day. There was a time where I was actually posting three times a day and really I was just trying to test the market to see um, when was the best uh, time to post. Um, so I would post in the morning, I would post again in mid-afternoon and I would post again at night just to see what what got the most traffic um, and these days I really really just post what makes me happy um, I'm not so much worried about what um, people what I think people want to see from me I really just want to post what makes me happy and I just want to post what is the most effective for promoting horror and advocating for horror. So um, I post my review cards from, you know, Kindle. Actually, it is Kindle copies, but I also like make those review cards for almost everything that I review just so that they're out there and, and can take the place of um, a curated uh, flat lay photo like I used to do because they, those just take a lot of time and effort. And in the winter months when natural light isn't as readily available, I can't often find the time to capture uh, a book in a curated photo. Um, so those help a great deal in just filling um, the space on my feed and also breaking it up between photos. Because when you get too many really pretty like flat lay photos all together, I feel like your your feed at a glance looks kind of cluttered. Um, not to mention... Instagram has changed their algorithm. So I'm really unsure like what works anymore. Um, it used to be that your post was seen in the order of when it appears. So like it would show up in someone's timeline like immediately when you post it. And now they kind of like show up at different times for different people depending upon your engagement with that person. So if you engage with somebody kind of on like a regular basis, they might see your post like immediately after you post it, but somebody that you don't engage with um, on a more regular basis might not even see it for like three days. Um, so Instagram has really, as soon as Facebook bought Instagram, it kind of changed the the way it goes. Um, and you could have, you know, 15,000 followers and only 2% of them see your photo for the day which is kind of a bummer um but you just have to just not care like at this point you just have to not worry about followers and not worry about what you think people want to see but just kind of post for yourself so that's what I'm about now is just what makes me happy and and it's horror fiction and promoting horror fiction so that's what I post yeah and I think the what makes me happy role is quite a good one to apply to most if not all areas of life i mean yeah sometimes we spend so much time worrying about different things and we really should just put our happiness at, at the forefront you know provided that we're not actually hurting other people <laughs> but assuming right. that's not happening then you know what makes you happy what lights you up right Yes, it's a good life lesson. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, what do you do in terms of following people? Because this is something that, I mean, I've been thinking about 
a lot recently. And I mean, I wonder, do you mostly follow people within the Bookstagram community? Is there a kind of strategy or does it just go back to kind of what we've said before? And it's like, well, follow people that make you happy that are doing interesting things that you want to see because I mean with with this as horror I'm certainly mostly following people within the horror community and in terms of my own personal Instagram I was so confused in terms of who to follow I actually don't follow anyone at the moment because I (laughs) I don't even know what rules to apply and there's part of me thinking okay let's uh, be on brand in the sense of like writing and podcasting and publishing and just follow people within that but then there's another part of me that's like well why don't I just follow like a really small amount of people but purely what I'm interested in and so that might not necessarily be horror and writing that might extend to Japan it might extend to like nutrition and paleo and things like that. Um, It might extend to philosophy. So I wonder, do you have any thoughts in terms of who to follow on Instagram? So I think it depends on what you use the different social media platforms for. Um, For instance, on Instagram, I have two separate accounts. I have a private account that I don't follow anybody in the Bookstagram community on. It's just for friends and family. Um, and it's very small. I only follow my friends and family. Um, but then I also kind of follow, like you were saying, like, uh, a yoga instructor or an Instagram account that is, you know, for my city that I live in, I use that account for that kind of thing. Um, and then my, uh, bookstagram account, I follow other bookish people that have similar interests. Um, So they're really into horror or they're book reviewers or they're just genuinely cool people. Um, And then on Facebook, um, I deleted my Facebook in 2016 during the election. And during the time that it was disabled, I actually logged into it and I deleted all of my friends and family (laughs) (laughs) on Facebook. Um, And I decided that I would reopen it um, when I uh, started Nightworms, um, but then just add industry people and just use Facebook for uh, that. You know, I don't use it for anything else. Um, Not really for like a personal platform at all, just a business contacts. And then um, on Twitter, I think Twitter and Instagram are almost kind of the same in the sense that, hmm, how do I want to say this without being extremely controversial? But um, I think our mental Ill- our mental health uh, is really needs to be protected um, with social media. So I follow people in the industry, authors, writers, publishers, fellow book reviewers, uh, bookstagrammers. Um, I follow them until if there's an issue or if something about that person is just not doing it for me anymore, or I don't feel safe, um, with them in my sphere. Um, so I have no problem like blocking individuals I feel are like toxic to my mental health, if that makes sense. So this is something that I've kind of like only developed in the last like year. I used to just let things slide or just kind of ignore things or just have anxiety about certain situations. And then I just started following this Instagram account called Florence Given. And she's this woman who empowers women. And she just kind of was making this case against social media pressures of following just anyone and everyone um, without boundaries. And so I don't do that anymore. I have like very clear boundaries. Like if somebody, you know, is intentionally hurtful or toxic or, you know, starting a lot of drama or something, I have no problem just cutting that person out. Um, and I think that in our society today, um, that could be seen as, 
you know, not being very gracious or um, kind of like cancel culture, but I feel like social media is so invasive to our personal life. And so um, you just kind of like, almost like you just leave the doors to your house open, if that's like a good metaphor. Like if you were just in your home doing your thing and talking to your friends and doing whatever, but like all your doors and windows are open and just anyone can come in and out, like that does not make sense to me. So like for me, I operate my social media like I would my house. Like this is my safe place and I'm just not going to let anybody walk in and out and treat me like shit, you know, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot that you're saying is really resonating. And I mean, firstly, we all need to put our mental health and indeed our overall health as our number one priority because without them, you know, I mean, we, we fall a piece to pieces. We can't operate properly. And I mean, for that reason, I've been very intentional to minimize my use of Facebook because for me, for whatever reason, and I'm not even sure what it is, to be honest, but it just doesn't make me feel that great. So I don't use mm -hmm. Facebook that much and I don't mm -hmm. have it on my phone. Um, but yeah, sometimes people will talk about, you know, rules in terms of how to manage your social media platform and, and your uh, page. And some people will say, you know, delete all those people that aren't kind of contributing to your happiness. So certainly delete those who are making you feel more negative. Whereas other people will say, well, you shouldn't do that because you shouldn't live in an echo chamber. And the, the reality is there are no rules apart from the rules that you decide as an individual. And you've got to decide what is going to make you happy and what is going to make sense in terms of your life and not deleting someone who's making you miserable because someone else said, don't live in an echo chamber. It's like, well, get real, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to yeah. do that if I want mm -hmm. to. And it's like, I don't live in an echo chamber anyway, because I live in the real world and social media isn't <laughs> exactly the real nice. world. And mm. I should be allowed to have my space where, you know, heaven forbid, I'm happy. I know maybe that's an awfully modern idea to want to be happy, <laughs> but you know, you, you do what you need to do. And also you're allowed to change your mind. And you don't have to justify that to anyone. And mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes people will get upset as well because they'll say, oh, your friends or you follow this person who is objectionable. And, and maybe they are, but if they don't know why you're following them, they're just making an assumption. It doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. mean you're actually friends with that person. You know, you might want to follow them to, to see what's going on um uh, particularly if it comes to the political sphere you might be interested in what on earth is this person going to tweet next i'll follow them mm -hmm. and find mm -hmm. out it might be yes. a kind of morbid curiosity but yeah i mean for me you do you you do what makes you happy and mm -hmm. if someone thinks you have to justify that to them looks like an unfriending is a coming <laughs> yeah, yeah. The whole thing with the cancel culture i think that if you're curating your own page about who you follow who follows you and things like that that's not really cancel culture yeah. cancel culture yeah. to me is when someone pulls some post that you did back in 1970 fucking nine <laughs> where you said something <laughs> stupid because you were drunk which you have apologized for profusely and then they ignore your apology and post this thing and talk about how terrible a human being you are because mm. they want attention. Yeah. Which all leads back to social media is not the problem. The internet's not the problem. People are the problem. Yeah. Amen, Bob. Seriously. Um, <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> anywhere you go, I'm going to go off on a tangent, but good. <laughs> Let's, <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do okay. It. Anywhere you go, um, there's always this fear of conflict. And there's always these people who are clamoring about trying to keep the peace and 
you know, if if there's any kind of whiff of a strife between people, um, you know, you're always going to have your your people who are going to show up to watch and be like, fight, fight, fight. And then you're going to have people who are going to be like, oh, can't we just all get along? And it's unrealistic, honestly, to um, fear conflict uh, in the sense that um, we all just need to get along. And wherever there's people gathering, there is going to be conflict because we're human beings and we're, we have opinions and we're going to have arguments. Now, there are some people like Bob was talking about who are just assholes and they just mm-hmm. troll, you know, they just want to flame you and to get you um, riled up. And that kind of drama is really just instigated so that they can get attention. And those are the kind of people you don't need in your life. Like just put them out on the fringes and, you know, go, go about protecting your mental health. But on the other hand, we have a horror family community and it's made up of industry people. It's made up of authors, uh, reviewers, readers, you know, we have this, this niche community that rallies around horror and, I'm tired of this idea that there's not going to be conflict and wherever, you know, somebody is making a stink about something or whatever, it's, you know, people are like, oh, it's a pile on or, oh, you know, you're calling this person out, la, la, la. It, it's, it's just a necessary thing for us to resolve conflict in a healthy way because we're going to have issues with one another and we're going to voice our opinion, you know, in the reviewing community. Uh, an author will be attacked for going on to Goodreads or whatever and saying something on somebody's review or correcting a thought or whatever. And then that is almost instantaneously tweeted as bad author behavior. But on the flip side, reviewers are doing bad shit all the time. And if you are a reviewer yourself and you call out other reviewers and be like, hey, this behavior is not cool. Like, don't tag authors in negative posts or in your review, don't, you know, do this or that. And immediately you're seen as somebody creating drama or controversy because, you know, you have an opinion about some do's or don'ts in the reviewing community. And so you'll get some reviewers saying like, oh, you're trying to create, you know, you're trying to be a mouthpiece for the rest of us. Um, And you'll get some reviewers who side with you. And then now all of a sudden you're creating conflict and then people are like, so freaked out over it but it's like these are the things we need to discuss like i mean if i can just throw out you know like well-behaved women don't you know they 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 don't make history and it's kind of the same um idea with our our social media like if you're just going to play status quo and never talk about anything controversial or never call anything out or never just be like hey why are we doing this behavior um, then I don't know. You're not, you're not going to be seen. That's just my opinion. Like, I feel like for, for me personally, um, I get viewed a lot as ruffling feathers or, you know, starting drama or whatever, because I don't just think that a reviewer's platform is a sacred place and nobody can touch it. I think that reviewers are doing shitty things all the time and I talk about it. And I just don't think a lot of people like that. So they don't want to have a discussion. They just want to have an argument. And then that's, you know, the most important thing is, is what you're trying to do is you, you're wanting to have a discussion and they, they twist it and turn it. Oh, absolutely. Or they think that, um, you know, I'm target preaching a specific person or whatever, but it's just a behavior that I've seen rampant in the reviewing community and it's not a specific person like I don't do that vague tweeting that I see all the time where somebody will just vague tweet about somebody else it's like I I hate that so much and I hate it actually I I hate it for positive and negative things (laughs) like even if people Mm -hmm. vague book something positive it's like oh just just tell me or don't tweet at all. <laughs> but. Well, there's just, there's, yeah, there's just the the risk that when you're vague tweeting about something, other people are going to think you're talking about them. Exactly. Like, yeah. You know, everyone's going to feel seen 
and everyone's going to get, you know, butthurt or twisted over what you're saying. And you could just be talking about some specific situation and then everyone's going to think it's about them. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I vague tweeted, I mean, I could do it now as an experiment, but I probably won't. But if I said, ah, oh, I got an email this morning and it really pissed me off. There's probably going to be a lot of people that are like, shit, was that my email? Yeah, was it mine? Yeah. Bob's like, what? I only asked you what time we were podcasting with Sadie. Why are you so (laughs) angry, Michael? Yeah. (laughs) But but yeah, like, I mean, anytime you you vague tweet something, you run the risk that you're then going to have someone upset because they think you're talking about them. And it's like, Mm -hmm. just just either be specific or don't tweet at all. Yeah. And mm. I mean, I, I feel as well that whenever we we tweet or we write something, that there's like the, the implicit caveat, like, this is my opinion. So if I say, you know, that this is like how I think reviewers should conduct themselves, it's my opinion. It's not an actual rule. And I mean, as Gwendolyn Keister said, your mileage may vary. Yeah. Yeah. People act like, you know, you you write an opinion and you've now put a law out or it's become the word. And Mm -hmm. I mean, Twitter doesn't give us enough characters to say the thing I'm about to write is my opinion. It's like, oh, shit, that's all I've wrote now. I've ran out of characters. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I just want to, like, you know, encourage people to embrace conflict as something that is a healthy part of being a part of a community and you just have to deal with situations as they arise in a healthy way like i mean just for an example i um i did unfollow somebody that i thought was um maybe had me muted or like just wasn't interested in what I was saying anymore. And maybe I was experiencing some hurt feelings over it or whatever. I I don't really remember the context of when I decided to unfollow them, but um, they messaged me, um, which I don't always advise after somebody unfollows you. But in this case, um, they messaged me and they just explained like, Hey, I saw that we aren't, you aren't following me anymore. Like, I just wanted to make sure that I didn't do or say anything that offended you. And we had this like amazing conversation in a private message. And um, she just explained some things about like what was going on in her life and, you know, that made it so that she just doesn't have a lot of time to interact on social media, you know, yada, yada. We ended up following each other and, and just agreeing to be more supportive of one another when we can. And I thought that that was like a really healthy way of dealing with a situation instead of me unfollowing her and then her like vague tweeting about like, Oh, when you um, wake up in the morning and realize that like so-and-so like unfollowed you, you know, like so- just starting drama. Yeah. Th- this is why I don't, there's, um, there's a Facebook app. I think it's called purity or something like that. And it notifies you anytime someone has unfriended you. I do not have that app because I imagine that would be, you know, pretty damaging for my mental health. And like, Mm -hmm. sometimes I'll notice someone has unfriended me, but because I don't have that app, could have been six months ago, it could have been a year ago, I'll just notice, oh, we're, we're not friends anymore. But I think, you know, if you want to know, then then I guess you could reach out and you could message that person, but don't make any assumptions because I mean, if you get your brain to make assumptions, you're going to start thinking, okay, like they think I'm a terrible person. I must've done something so bad. Whereas the reality is often either you just don't talk to each other that much and they're getting rid of people that they're not interacting with, or it could be that, you know, for, maybe I post too much about this as horror and they want something um, more personal, but there's so many reasons why someone could unfriend you and it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. I mean, also, like, there's no right. People don't have to be friends with me. Like, that's not not a thing that I can stipulate, but I think people Mm -hmm. get so upset over being unfriended and 
or or then like if they see that person in person they'll they'll feel awkward about it but there's so many reasons so don't get upset yeah right yeah and social media defines our connections with people in a really weird way like i think it's odd that um on facebook i think it is that you have x amount of friends well i mean are they friends or are they just kind of like acquaintances like even your family members are friends like my husband and i are quote unquote friends on facebook um Mm -hmm. but it's it's a weird terminology to give to people that you don't really know or strangers and also like on twitter and instagram to call people followers it's like i understand the concept there that you know you have followers um and you can unfollow somebody. I think that's like maybe a healthier way to define it instead of friends. But when you start defining things as friends, then when you quote unquote unfriend somebody, it's like, but we weren't really, we're not like friends in the sense that like, I know you, you know what I mean? Like, uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, on Twitter, it's, it's the same thing. It's like, okay, well, we have been following each other for maybe a year or two, but I mean, we're not friends. (laughs) <laughs> yeah right. and, and, and it should be connections to yeah. me i think that would be a much better word because then you could disconnect with someone it doesn't have any type of connotation you just no longer connect you know yeah yeah that's a good and word when people think that their that your facebook relationship is a stronger relationship than you if you especially if you know the person personally and you've met them many many times maybe went to school with them i've had this conversation a lot of times people's like yeah i see you on facebook i sent you a friend request and and my answer is like hey look we're friends we don't need to become friends on social media yeah (laughs) right you know, and, I, right. and 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 then, but me and I'm you know, like brutally honest, and I'm like, and I'm I'm just seeing your post, and they're kind of dumb. <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> what? You didn't like my jokes? And I'm like, no, I thought they were pretty stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, well, golly, Bob, your stuff's pretty dumb too. I'm like, yeah, hey, let's. You want to go get to eat? Or what? Yeah, let's go eat. All right, <laughs> you know, because you're having a real life situation when you think that social media is more important than a real life connection there's something seriously wrong with you right yeah Yeah, and you don't owe anybody anything there's no i think brian Keene had a post about that um really recently where he was just talking about like hey i don't owe you anything like if i want to unfollow you for whatever reason or i don't like the atmosphere you bring to my feed or my your comments or whatever like i don't owe you a follow i'm sorry like and i and i can unfollow you just to save myself some sanity for the day like you know it's just like you don't i don't have to give you an explanation Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i've met brian keen's a cup you know a couple a few times and I follow him. He doesn't follow me. And whenever we talk, in, like in person, like a killer con, I don't bring up, hey, you don't follow me on social media. <laughs> you know, because he's just going to look. He goes, well, I don't have to follow you, Bob. <laughs> you know? But at the same time, I mean, I can walk right up to him and he'd be like, hey, Bob Pestro, what's going on? See, that's a real connection. Right. That, that social media can never replicate. You don't have to follow someone. They don't have to. I follow him just so I can make sure, you know, find out what the new podcast is going to be about, what he's got going on. You know, I follow him as a fan. But, I mean, you know, we've apparently, and I may have forgotten, but we, we've we actually known each other for a long time. So I just thought I met him like a couple of years ago. But he's like, no, we met a long time ago. I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I apparently didn't make that much of an impression. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, my um, my business partner in, in Nightworms, uh, Ashley, she also says that sometimes she thinks that she's already following people because she'll see things in her Twitter feed from that person. And it's really only because I follow that person and I engage with that person. And then because Ashley and I follow each other, that shows up in her feed. And so she sometimes thinks that she's following people and then realizes that she had never made uh, that connection with them. Um, I've seen her a few times being like, what? I already thought I followed you. I'm so sorry. You know, and then she'll tell me like, how does this happen? You know, I think it's she just thinks that because she sees the engagements going on on her feed, which is a weird thing that Twitter does, like 
you know, you get to see these engagements between other people and you don't even necessarily follow um, them, but because somebody that you follow is engaging with it, you'll see it. Um, so yeah, so like even sometimes when somebody doesn't follow you, I'm thinking of someone in particular that I think thinks they're following me, but they're not. Um, but it would be so awkward to come to that person and be like, why aren't you following me? Yeah, I have that happen a lot. I don't even know if I'm following either of you because I don't, I don't pay <laughs> attention. Well, I'm, I'm definitely you gotta, you fo- follow I'm fo- me, Michael. I'm following yeah, Sadie. Really I've confirmed that just now. But yeah, like, or sometimes, like, you know, you're following someone on on two out of the three social networks, and it's like, well, I assumed I followed you on everything, but mm-hmm. no, I get, well, I can confirm our, our listeners, and you will both be delighted to hear that i follow you both on twitter so there you go awesome well, what about instagram we're not real friends if well, you're I, not don't, following I, I definitely don't follow either of you on my personal instagram because i don't follow anyone i think i'm like kenya west i've got some weird ego obviously <laughs> but um, <laughs> may, maybe 1.5 fo- million followers maybe this following zero <laughs> i think i think this is horror follows sadie on instagram not sure it follows you bob but you don't post a lot on instagram so you know be, I, be, yet, I can't figure out instagram i'm looking at a picture and then i read the comment above it and i'm like going that makes no sense and so <laughs> it's like it's a picture then comment or comment then picture yeah <laughs> you know, i mean i don't know because i'm looking at it on my phone and of course you know everything is just up and down there's no no more left or right everything is up and down i'm trying to read my kindle the other night and i'm swiping up I'm like, oh, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it's like, I don't understand Instagram. It's, it's, it makes, it has no sense to me. <laughs> and I, when I look at it, I don't even know if it's like a post and people would like my post and I look and it's like, that's a picture I posted back in 1940s. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't understand <laughs> I just posted a picture. No one likes it, but they like the older stuff. So, I mean, I'm, I haven't yet to figure it out. It took me a while with Twitter. I didn't know. I was like, hey, this is my first tweet. And then I was like, I didn't go back for like three months, you know. Is that what you wrote, Bob? Hi, this know. is my first tweet. <laughs> Goodbye. I can't, I, can't, I can't go back, you know. I mean, I, I guess you can. Somebody found it, and they're going to use it against me, you know. So, I apologize for that. <laughs> Whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to This Is Horror with Sadie Hartman. Join us again next time for the second and final part of the conversation. But if you would like to get it ahead of the crowd, if you would like to get every episode ahead of the crowd, then become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror and with all that is going on in these uncertain times surrounding covid19 bob pastorella and i are going to try to put out as much content as we can over on patreon to give you some entertainment to give you some information and to hopefully take your mind off things with all that good horror fiction stuff and We've got a story unboxed episode coming up. We most recently recorded two installments of the Patrons Only Q&A sessions. And we've got a number of This Is Horror podcast conversations coming very soon. Including a conversation with Richard Thomas. One with Justin Park to celebrate the five year anniversary of Sinister Horror Company. And then, well... The tables are turned and Dan Hauer from Bob Pastorella interview me to coincide with my new novella release, The Girl in the Video. So if you want that and you want a lot, lot more, if you want to be able to submit questions to each and every guest, it's patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Okay, before I wrap up, a quick word from our sponsors. Following a cryptic message from her brother, Beth Davis finds herself in the strange coastal town of Netherworld Bay and discovers a secret cult planning to bring about the end of days. 
Can she stop them in time or will she lose her very soul forever? The Netherwell Horror is a terrifying blood-soaked tale that is not to be missed. Available in ebook and paperback and now on audio, search The Netherwell Horror on Audible or Amazon now. Don't just read horror, experience it. Being an independent publisher, we are just like you. We share the same passion, the same love for horror fiction. We believe in the incredible work being created, unnoticed by the mainstream. And we want to share it with the world. We are the Sinister Horror Company. As always, I would like to end with a quote. And this is from Edgar Rice Burroughs. If you write one story, it may be bad. If you write a hundred, you have the odds in your favour. And on that note, I will see you in the next episode for part two with Sadie Hartman. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing and have a great great day. This is Horror Podcast.